Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. It does sound sophisticated. Sophisticated, yeah. Did the ACE community for three years now. Actually outline everything. Something that we find in the society. First, talk about the problems that you're trying to solve. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of Deep Random Talks. Today, we are going to talk about knowledge management and uh, we have a very uh, awesome guest, Stian, with us. And I'm here with my co-host, Amar, and we're going to talk about a lot of interesting things in knowledge management, professional development, and a lot of topics around that. Uh, but before we start, uh, Amar, what's new with you? Hmm. Well, there are about eight days to our Creative Destruction Live Meetup. So a few late evenings these days. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. We, I guess for those who are less familiar, Creative Destruction Lab is a startup accelerator in Toronto, uh, and we are going to be part of their next cohort uh, over the next eight months. So you're probably going to hear a lot about that as we go forward. And Estienne, uh, tell us about yourself a bit. Yeah, so uh, very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Stian Hoklev, and I am calling in from Norway. Um, I'm currently working uh, for a company called Tana that just went out of stealth uh, a week ago. And before that, I was a PhD student in uh, pedagogy and technology, and I worked at something called the Minerva uh, Project. Beautiful. We are very excited to have you with us today. And you guys made quite a bit of noise on Twitter a few days ago. So I'm uh, I'm excited to go deeper in, into what you're doing as you're coming out of a stealth now as well. Uh, but before that, what is everybody drinking? I'm having my morning coffee because it's in the early in the morning as we're recording this. Same. How about you? Black. Coffee. Nice and simple. <laughs> Right. Black coffee here as well. The last oh. coffee of the afternoon. All right. You're, you're, is that like espresso? Uh, no, I just have a, a huge container that I fill up and then, because nice. I hate my coffee going cold. So just take <laughs> little sips. All right. That's smart. That's smart. I might copy that idea. All right. Uh, sounds good. So Amar, you uh, suggested the idea of bringing a stien. So tell us a little about, you know, what were you thinking? What was interesting about what he was working on? Hmm. So knowledge management has really started to take off in the past five, six years. But Steer is one of the f few folks who I found has been thinking and working about it for, I'd say, close to 20 years now with his PhD, his postdoc, his experience at Rome and Minerva. So I wanted someone who's been there, who's been thinking about this since the start of when knowledge management wasn't even popular. Hundred percent, and and Stian, you you started way back when as a student in international development. Take us back there, like what was happening in your life there. So I studied international development studies in Toronto, uh, and I came. I mean, I started programming early on, primary school, learning BASIC through uh, Learn BASIC with Dino, amazing books, um, and I soon got interested in the open source movement. And I remember trying to configure Linux on a, you know, trying to set up the X, uh, X window system and spending hours. I just thought it was so fascinating that you could kind of go behind the scenes of what was happening in the computer and uh, the different communities that were building software together. Um, and so what was happening at the same time as I was um, studying international development studies is um, the growth of the open content movement. So a lot of people inspired by the open source, not just the licenses and the, and the legal infrastructure, but also the, the social ways of organizing around uh, creation, remixing, building upon, adaptation, acceptation. And uh, you had uh, what would become Creative Commons licenses. You had um, open scholarship. Uh, you had Wikipedia. And uh, of course, this had a lot of relevance for development studies as well, because in the field of development studies, you have NGOs, which are often, unfortunately, very protective of their own data and methods, even though they should be working together. And you have issues of access to information in developing countries. You have big issues around linguistics. Um, 
you know, what resources are available in different languages and are you actually allowed to translate something because it has an open license or is it copyrighted? And even if you wanted to, you couldn't. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, that was a bit the setting for how I got interested in all of this. Very interesting. And and I believe you attended a conference that was sort of a, a pivotal moment for you uh, on, on open source and specifically ideas that you saw around Creative Commons license was uh, was very important. For for those who are less familiar, can you, you know, quickly recap what is Creative Commons license and, and how did that inspire everything else that you started doing? So the interesting thing about copyright is that copyright is automatic. Anything that you put, well, anything you put on a piece of paper, but more relevantly, uh, anything you put online is by default copyright to you. There's no need for a statement, you know, a C uh, in a circle and so on. And yet, m much of what we publish, we are quite willing to let other people use. Uh, but there wasn't a good way for us to signal that. And so, you know, of course, people are taking things anyway. But for people who, who respect uh, the author's intention or the law, um, all of this great content that people put out there was basically by default off limits. And the Creative Commons guys uh, and girls wanted to come up with a very simple way uh, of signaling both to humans and to computers um, what the copyright status of a work is. So if I put up a blog post and I'm happy for you to reuse that in your textbook um, or in you know whatever thing that you're doing, then I can put a Creative Commons license on it, and it can be I can say you can do whatever you want with it. You should give me attribution. You should not make money off it, or you can use it but don't modify it in any way because it's my poem and you know I care about it or something. And that license is very easy to read. So there's like a simple, uh, si uh, simple symbol. It also has a full legalese so that if you don't follow the license, I, I could theoretically sue you. But there's also some metadata for computers that enables, for example, Google um, to say, hey, show me all the images that I'm actually allowed to use in my presentation. And it can automatically scan through that. Um, and so that was the practical underpinnings, very pragmatic. But then around this, there was a community. And uh, in 2000, I think seven, there was a iCommons conference, which was really amazing in the way that it brought together people who don't usually meet. There were uh, open source activists, programmers. There were um, ac academics who were interested in open scholarship. There were authors and musicians who were interested in putting their works out there for free, but still making money somehow. There were entrepreneurs who were thinking about what are new business models that we can build on top of, of free content. And you know, having all these people in the same room uh, was incredibly generative. Uh, and also um, what was really generative and I'm eternally grateful for is the, the so we had a subsection on education and people went around the room and um, asked, you know, why are you here? What are you interested in? This time I'm an undergraduate. I follow people in this conference. I read their blogs. Nobody knows who I am. So, you know, I'm trying to get to know people, but I don't know where to start. And so I say, I'm really interested in the future of education. I want to know what the future of the university is because so many things like, you know, the gym and the huge lawns and the, even the libraries and these kind of things are not necessarily crucial anymore, but there are certainly elements that are crucial. And what are those and how can we provide them to as many people as possible? And so the moderator keeps going around the circle. Three other people say, oh, I also want to talk about that. And so the moderator says, okay, here's a breakout room, some white paper. You guys have two hours. And during those two hours, we had never met before. And we basically came up with the idea that would turn into something called peer-to-peer -peer university. Okay. Okay, that was a very unexpected yet organic transition there. But could you, could you unpack the peer-to-peer -peer university a bit for us? Like, uh, what were you hoping to achieve out of it? What were the early days like? So the situation in 2007 was we did not have even Web 2.0 yet. Um, we had Web 1.0, uh, static pages. And for education, the biggest thing that had happened was the MIT OpenCourseWare, uh, which a lot of different universities around the world followed suit. 
and basically started using the Creative Commons license uh, to release material, uh, often PDFs uh, and, and, and example sets and sometimes full lecture recordings. But these were two hour you know, lecture recordings. They were not 10 minute you know, fancy MOOC videos. And they would just put them out there and you could do whatever you wanted with them. Um, and so we had all these amazing resources for the first time, being able to you know, peek at how do they actually teach at these elite universities or how do they teach at a, a Saudi Arabian university or a Chinese university. It's also super interesting to me. Um, but there was no, you couldn't even leave a comment if you wanted to. And it was certainly not set up for a good learning experience. So what we thought was lacking was curation. We needed someone to come in and among all of the great open resources and open journal articles and documentaries on YouTube and Wikipedia articles, like what is a path through a topic for someone who is not experienced in that topic? It's hard to choose for yourself. And we needed cohorts to basically study groups who could go through that material together. And we were trying to do this very much in the, in the sense of Wikipedia or, or the Wikimedia Foundation. Can we you know, bring together a lot of volunteers um, to curate this material and then to run these learning groups. And through doing these experiments, you know, we really wanted to be a learning organization. So it was kind of, can we prototype a wide variety of approaches to how do we train the trainers? You know, um, how do we, what kind of software or, or platform uh, would, would facilitate this kind of collaborative learning that we were looking for? So that, that, that's a very interesting transition because aggregate intellect is also going, I guess, through an accelerated version of what you're describing, you know, your experience happened over years. Uh, but, you know, we also saw it with the idea that education was what, what was missing and very quickly got to the point that there is content out there. So the problem is really curation and group learning. And I think, you know, that that's something that you realized in, you know, after 2007, probably 2010 and early teens um, and you wanted to go deeper to understand, okay, from an intellectual point of view, what does it even mean? And that brought you to do a PhD on that topic. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, um, I, I was really interested in um, both the technology and the pedagogy and how those two come together when it comes to adults learning together uh, and this peer to peer pedagogy that we were interested in. And I went in to do a PhD in computer-supported collaborative learning. So not how can the computer teach you, but how can the computer facilitate uh, multiple individuals learning together? And of course, this has a long, long uh, tradition of, of really deep, uh, interesting research. And so basically through my PhD, you could say that I approached the topic of knowledge management you know, on two different dimensions. Uh, my topic of research was how groups learn together and the idea of doing you know, project-based learning, doing authentic inquiry, having each student kind of bring a lot of their own personality and own interests into the, into the topic and uh, you know, what kind of media or mediums they use, whether it's blogs or concept maps or multi-touch tablets, and how does that um, influence the way that they communicate and you know, ultimately learn as a group and as individuals? And what is the relationship between group learning and individual learning and extended cognition and group cognition? And so all these incredibly interesting topics. But as I'm doing this research and, and experiments and thinking about this, I'm also preparing to write my PhD thesis. And, you know, one of the difficulties in education is that it seems like the, you know, a theory is never supplanted by another theory. Uh, it's, you just kind of add to it. Uh, so there's a, a massive amount of, of um, stuff that you need to keep track of as you're reading these very, very dense and deep papers. And you know that in three, four years, you are going to be writing about these. And you need to not only remember the specific ideas, but also exactly on which page you read them, uh, which is already daunting. But at the same time, as I was following you know, the, the growth of the, the Creative Commons, and I was really interested in open science. So I was an activist at our university for um, you know, open access to published materials. Um, that seems like a no-brainer to me. But I was interested in pushing beyond that. And you know, a lot of the 
the lab scientists were looking at open lab notebook science. So can we start actually share our notebooks from the experiments, you know, a year before the final article is actually published? Can we get a much faster um, feedback loop among scientists working on a problem? And so in education, A, I don't have a lab notebook in the same sense, and B, also my, my lab results are human subjects, so I cannot share them as freely. But I was looking at all of the research that I'm doing, only a, a tiny percentage of that will be represented in the final um, published version. But if I'm in a topic that's relatively unexplored, then a lot of that early processing might also have value for others. So how could I actually not only organize the knowledge for myself in a way that it's useful in three years, but also share that intermediate, um, you know, uh, pro semi-processed um, version of my notes with others. Very interesting. So, so you, you are a very good example of, I guess, eating your own dog food, right? Like essentially you were researching the topic, but you were also trying to practice it and advocate for it at, at even the university level. And, one thing that you said that was interesting for me was, you know, on the topic of organizing knowledge and sort of progressively releasing the early versions of the work rather than the cleaned up, you know, summarized version that ends up being probably 1% of the knowledge you explored. Um, what are, I, I guess, both from a theoretical point of view, because, you know, you've studied research this, but also from a personal point of view, your own experience what what ended up being you know the most crucial artifacts and processes that are you know best suited to help people organize their knowledge um you mentioned a few different artifacts like you know lab notes and concept maps etc uh talk to us a little about that like both from a theoretical point of view but also from your personal experience there so for my personal knowledge management, the thing that frustrated me to no end and is actually not a solved problem even in 2022 is the simple workflow to go from, you know, you do a search on Google Scholar, you got a bunch of PDFs and don't get me started on PDFs, but, you know, let's skip that. So you have these PDFs, you maybe highlight them, you uh, extract some stuff. And now you have, uh, then you hopefully add your own thoughts and insights and questions to those uh, annotations. And then you want to actually start reading across papers. And let's say you read 10 papers about the same topic. Now you need to start weaving and start saying, well, how do these three different papers approach the question? How do, maybe they have different definitions of the same thing that they're, they're you know, in the title, it says the same, but actually they're talking about three different. So you need to really go deep. And uh, you, know, you have reference managers that keep track of, you know, here's every paper and here's the author and I can generate a nice citation for you. And you have notebooks and you have PDF readers and none of these play together. And so I I created something that was very, you know, MacGyver-esque uh, and, and not easy to distribute, but which actually let me go that whole way and always keep provenance because that is so important for academics. So we would, you know, even if I took a little sliver of text and copied it to another page, it would kind of know exactly where that came from at the beginning. So, and, and it also let me publish that. However, I would have done things very differently today had I, well, then if I had known what I've learned from the note-taking community, because I spent so much time going from the, the raw highlights of a single paper to compressing them, condensing them, expressing them in my own words, which, which was valuable. I did that per paper and I didn't check off a paper until I'd gone through that process, but I spent so little time building, building on top of the questions or the concepts or the insights. And also I over-optimized uh, early on. I, I said, okay, I'm going to read the paper and I'm going to finish it. And, you know, one of the things I've picked up, for example, from Tiago Forte, who has this concept of, um, incremental uh um like marking up a paper or joel chan talks about incremental formalization is that you don't know what you need up front so if you do the minimal possible but you get it into your system and you know that you can find it for each additional pass you add more structure you link it to more things you refine it you synthesize it that has two benefits the first one is that naturally you're going to spend more time on the things that turn out to be more useful 
because those are the things that you keep coming back to. And so you're not wasting time by prematurely, you know, deeply um, processing some paper that might be irrelevant. But also you have the time, you have some kind of a spaced repetition effect that if you come back to that paper, instead of fully processing a paper and then that's, you know, it's there until four years later, you're writing your thesis by repeatedly coming back to it after you've read a bunch of other stuff, it's now, you know, creating a lot of new connections in your brain. Uh, and so I would have, you know, the setup was the right foundation, but I think I would have optimized for different things had I had the chance to do it over. But Steve, we know that after your academic experience, you went more on a hands-on kind of approach at Minerva in Rome and most recently at Tana. I want to start taking us there a bit. So once you were kind of coming out of that deeply academic experience, what were some of your initial hypotheses kind of jumping into the more hands-on knowledge management world? So after my PhD, I realized that I really liked building systems to support learning. I wasn't really, I, I learned a huge amount from all of the reading and all of the research that I did, but I was more interested in taking those insights and uh, enabling them to be kind of used in the world than adding to those insights. Um, and so I was able to um, get a postdoc at EPFL in Switzerland which is uh, one of the top you know, computer science uh, universities in the world. And it was a lab that was very heavy, heavy on computer science, but also on pedagogical theory. So it was a really interesting place to try to take all of these theories and build a system. And, and it, it was a very ambitious idea. It was, can we create a kind of a no-code environment for teachers where they can uh, design very complex collaborative learning scenarios um, and actually express them in a way that the computer can execute them, right? So this might be, you know, first I want all the students sorted in groups of four, and then they should read different articles, and then they should be recombined in groups so that each group has, you know, one person who has read um, each of the articles, and they should answer this reflection question, and then that the, the answers to that. Should, so it was this kind of a workflow of both students across different groups and artifacts across different groups and with learning analytics and dashboards and everything. And it, it was a, and we worked on this for three years. It was, um, I still believe it, it would be an, an amazing startup if someone wanted to pick it up, it's all open source, but uh, we didn't have, um, yeah, you know, we we underestimated how hard it is to get people started with these kind of uh, these kind of ideas, and without a team that's doing uh, you know community support and and all of that stuff, uh, we just had zero uptake. Um, and you know, so that I guess that was a good lesson that if you build it, they won't necessarily come. It's one of the oldest lessons out there, but it feels like everyone has to learn it for themselves. As a guy who lives in community, I can totally empathize with that. It is a real bit of work. So given what you learned over there, what, what was the transition after? Like, what did you go to next? Right. So I've, I've been admiring Minerva since I first heard about them because I have always been interested in higher education and lifelong learning more so than primary and secondary. And especially, in, you know, I, I studied comparative higher education as, at my master's. And even at a school, one of the largest schools of education in the world, it felt like everyone was just polishing at the edges. They were saying, well, you know, let's add one credit hour of this. Let's, you know, maybe we'll add some clickers to the, this large lecture class, or maybe we'll tweak the way the multiple choice questions work. And you know, there are an infinite amount of possible ways of organizing a higher education system. And, and we are so incredibly, you know, captured in, in the kind of, uh, path dependency that we're in. And so seeing someone trying to do something completely different uh, and actually not not just a MOOC, not just lots of free resources, anyone can do what they want, highly selective, not free, but uh, accredited. But you know everything else is not only different, but also extremely intentional uh, and backwards design, you know, starting with what kind of students do we want to produce to face the challenges of the 21st century. And that's something that any president could put in their you know, annual speech, but really taking the consequences of that and working backwards and saying, you know, we're, we're not just gonna make this, uh, this um, a speech, we're going to analyze those skills 
We're going to think about how we can teach them, how we can measure them. And then we're going to design the entire four-year program and the pedagogical approach and even the pedagogical tools and even where in the world the students live and how we select them to achieve that goal. Um, it's an incredible ambition. And, and so I've been following them for, for years. And uh, when I had the chance to then join them, it very much felt like the opportunity to continue the work that I had started um, as a postdoc, but surrounded by you know, people who could take the technical and pedagogical innovations and actually um, you know, make them work with thousands of students, having, uh, for example, physics professors who were dedicated to this way of teaching, who could take the technology and create the kind of powerful learning that me as a researcher building some technology and going to the physics professor on campus and saying, hey, can you try this out in your class next Friday? I, I would never have been able to achieve those kind of learning outcomes, you know, in, in, in that way. Um, so <clears throat> uh, uh, over the weekend, I was having a conversation about some of these topics with one of our community members. And one of the interesting things that came up was this subjectivity of knowledge organization. And whenever you're talking about, you know, collaborative learning and collaborative peer-to-peer -peer projects and peer-to-peer -peer learning and education. And I believe you even said in our coordination call that there's always been some tension for you between self-directed learning, group learning, uh, even like, you know, should you spend your time creating tools for personal knowledge management versus tools for educators and teachers and such. Uh, so, how what what is your current opinion about that question because if something is subjective as much as knowledge organization is uh if you want to create a system for you know better knowledge management and then a social system around it so that they can contribute and collaborate and interact then you need some sort of objectivity so it, does that make sense where where does that objectivity or where should that objectivity come from if you want to create a system that multiple parties with different ambitions and objectives and, you know, states of mind and states of ability can come together and contribute. So I think the one of the key tensions that we discussed is around the locus of control and the you know amount of kind of design and, um, uh, you know, being teacher directed versus very bottoms up and maybe even not having a teacher, but being more network and you know, self-directed learners. And a lot of the work around uh, massive open online courses, which were all the rage, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer university, and of course, just anything that you see on Stack Overflow and Replit and you know, these kind of platforms um, is self-directed learning. It's bottoms up, it's networked, it's people you know, taking what they need and then ideally sharing it. and and so on. And it's incredibly powerful. Uh, but we also know there's at least two problems with it. Uh, one is it is selective. And one of the things we saw very clearly with the massive open online courses and the peer-to-peer -peer university, where we had these very naive uh, ambitions at first uh, of kind of supplying education to people who did not have access to it otherwise. And yet we realized that you know, almost everyone who signed up to take peer-to-peer -peer university courses uh, already had a master's and a full-time job, and many of them had PhDs. And in fact, I know for a fact that um, a large percentage of people taking massive open online courses and being successful also have, you know, uh, high, high uh, educational backgrounds. They have successful jobs um, because these things require you to have a very large degree of self-efficacy, uh, you need not only to have the skills to learn, the concentration, but also the belief that you can uh, sit down and learn. And uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't like one 16-year-old kid in Africa who's building his own airplane and, you know, with internet, he, he or she can go much further than they could otherwise. But it isn't a solution to, to everything. Um, that's the first thing. But I think even for these high-efficacy individuals, you know, acquiring a broad liberal arts undergraduate degree, which is... A, a very American concept, I would say. In Europe, we often go very more quickly into the disciplinary focus. But I think there's something very beautiful about this idea that we are training citizens in a democracy. And yes, the skills that you learn should you know, be applicable 
but they should also help you be a critical uh, individual. And there is there's a lot of things that we don't know that we should learn. And I think there is something about placing trust in an institution. And perhaps, unfortunately, all of our institutions don't deserve that trust today. But I still think, you know, there is uh, something to be said for saying, yes, you know, I'm 18 years old. Um, I want to become this critical, uh, well-read, well-rounded uh, individual. And um, I believe that Minerva has figured out a program. I'm going to go into it. I'm going to question everything. I'm going to be critical. Uh, but I'm also going to engage fully with what, what they're proposing to me. Uh, so I, th I think there's absolutely a space for both. Hmm. So from academia, really absorbing all the theory, being more of a researcher figure to Minerva, where you could do that. And they had the, essentially the community and the scale to apply it and test it out in the wild. That, say, I'd say from starting from your um, master's was a very education rethinking focus. After that, though, you went more into what a layman might call note-taking software. Rome and more recently, China. How, how did that happen? That, that's what I want to ask next. Ask next. So I, I built my own note-taking system during my PhD, which I mentioned. And there are still videos of it on, on YouTube if people want a trip down memory lane. Uh, but I, because it was so cumbersome, I even abandoned it myself uh, and was never quite happy with, I mean, I was doing a lot of reading during my postdoc and it was very scattered and I was not happy with it, but I never had time to sit down and do something about it. And uh, when I came across the first videos about Rome research, and this would be in December of 2019, only a few months after it was open to the public. Uh, and I immediately kind of recognize that this is what I was trying to do by myself. Uh, but not only could I not do it as well, but more importantly, I didn't have the vocabulary because what Rome Research did, which is almost more important than the software it created, is that I believe for the first time it brought together an incredible array of people um, who had been maybe individually thinking about this. Uh, some of them coming from the productivity space, some of them from the psychological journaling, some of them from academics, some of them from wikis. Uh, I mean, very broad backgrounds, but people and you know, people were reading about Settelkasten, they were reading about Evergreen Notes and Andy Matushek. And many of these people actually didn't use Rome Research. I mean, Andy Matushek, a very important figure in the community, never used Rome Research, but he was in that community that I think Rome Research and Connor, by his the force of his personality, kind of gestalted. And uh, for me, it was incredibly exciting to to start putting words on these like very nebulous concepts that I had. Um, and, and so I got very deep into this burgeoning community, and it was also fun to be at kind of the ground floor of something that would become very big. But I was, you know, I start I organized the first Rome Research meetup in the world uh, in San Francisco in January. I met with Connor also at uh, that same trip um, and started writing plugins, uh, you know, writing a, a newsletter that was short lived. So I got very deep into uh, and, of course, using it every single day. And I think also for me, it was both starting to use Rome research and shifting from an academic job to an industry job in some ways gave me a much longer time perspective. It's strange to say so because you would hope that academia is the place in which you can think long term. But in fact, uh, you know, today the job security, the kind of constant pressure to publish, I often felt like, oh, you know, this field of research seems interesting, but I didn't read up on it during my PhD and now it's too late. I'm not going to have time to read up on it quickly enough to publish, so I'm just going to skip it. Uh, which is a horrible thing to think, but I was, you know, I was constantly driven. And after leaving academia, still having these interests, but having a safe job, I could suddenly start thinking like, hey, I want to learn about ancient Greek philosophy. It might take me five years. Well, that's okay. I'm, you know, I'm going to be here in five years. Either I'll know a lot about Greek philosophy or I won't know anything, but either way, I'll still be here in five years. Like, so, and, and the important thing about spacing it out and having that long, long time perspective because I can't study eight hours a day like a PhD student, 
is that I need to have a tool and a methodology where I feel like I'm building on top of something. So I'm feeling like I can put in half an hour this morning, reading, thinking, taking some notes, and it's all accumulating over the years. And I think that's what Rome gave me, this sense that, wow, I can, I can now dare to, to dream about uh, more ambitious learning project, projects. Interesting. And I think that was part of the reason and sort of the mental shift that you had to move on to Tana, which you described as Rome meets Notion meets Airtable or a tool or a set of tools and social systems for learning together as you're doing complex projects over time. So break that up for us, like expand on it. So what it, in Tana, before even getting to what Tana is, why are those three components necessary? Why is the Rome part necessary? Why is the Notion part necessary? And what about Airtable? So the thing that made Rome, I think, so impressive to many people was, let's say, first of all, outlining. So you say, okay, I, I, I can, I've never really outlined before, but it's pretty logical to me. So I'm just going to take some notes. I'm going to indent wherever it makes sense. Like, yes, three ideas, indent, idea one, two, three. Uh, I have something to say about idea one, indent, put it there. Like, no big deal. And linking, I had been working a lot with wikis, both you know Wikipedia, but also wikis for learning. So the linking was pretty logical to me. The thing, one thing that was new was a daily page, which made me, uh, initially I thought it was a silly idea because I wasn't a journaler. Many Rome people have said the same, but eventually I realized the brilliance of it um, absolving you of the need to choose where to write something and just start writing and linking. So you do that for a few days, take some notes from some podcasts or some books, and then you click on a concept and suddenly you have through the even though you've never written on that page you have through the backlinks not only in this podcast this topic was mentioned but in this podcast when they were talking about acceptation the third example was indeed you know the thing that you're interested in and you can just open it and so on so that was a revelation and it was quite amazing the problem is once you've been using rome every day for a year and you're writing about things that you care deeply about now you open the page on Settelkasten or Andy Matushek or, you know, Greek philosophers, and you have a hundred backlinks. And it's like this, and you don't feel calm. You don't feel excited. You feel overwhelmed. And at that point, Rome doesn't give you almost any tools to work with that information. So it lets you create the feed. And that was a, a brilliant, you know, I mean, obviously... Rome didn't invent it, but I, I do believe they brought together a number of different things for the first time. It was a, absolutely a big step forward. But where we're missing is, okay, now we have this feed. How do we create workflows around this feed? And they need to be multiple workflows. I want to be able to slice and dice and reorganize and garden and synthesize and uh, annotate in different contexts because the notes I have about Settlecasten related to this book I'm writing are going to be different from the notes I need for this blog post I'm writing. And, and so that's where the, the data model of Rome is just not sophisticated enough, the UI also not flexible enough. Uh, and I think a lot of Rome users who have been using Rome heavily for a year or two are feeling that pain. So. Uh, you know, the, on the personal note-taking front, you know, the the, the ease of capture uh, and, and sending information in different parts, the daily page, all of that stuff is absolutely great. And, and Tana has that, Logseek has that, a bunch of different apps have that now. Then being able to um, create workflows, searches, reports, ways of, uh, uh, you know, working with that data contextually is... Um, one thing I think Tana does better than anyone else at this point. And then, of course, uh, the collaboration aspect, um, because for me, uh, you know, I, I wrote something quite soon after I began using Rome as I was thinking about this. Again, going back to the two dimensions of my work for my PhD, where I was taking notes personally, but I was also thinking about knowledge um, for groups. And I was thinking about open access and science for the world, right? So... To me, these three dimensions are really fascinating to think about in note-taking. So you could spend your whole life 
thinking about how to best take personal notes. And you could write books like Settlecast and you could write apps. You could you know, do all these kinds of things. You could spend your whole life, and people do, thinking about how to do knowledge management for groups and teams. And there are conferences, there are books, there are tools about how to manage flows of information and awareness and so on. And you could spend your whole life thinking about how to make the knowledge infrastructure of the world better, whether it's open access science or uh, you know, um, Wikipedia or metadata, JSON, LD, all these kind of things. And to me, that I wanted to think at all these three levels, but also the transitions that I might be taking notes that will eventually be shared with my team for feedback. Then maybe I'll publish it. Then I'll be reading stuff that I'll take into my personal base. And so how can you go between these layers? And I think Tana is definitely not the tool that can do all of that today. Uh, but it feels like the team at Tana and the community that we've already started building is a really interesting place to explore those futures. Beautiful. And so I, I want to summarize what you said and check my understanding. So essentially, Tana, the, the three components that I mentioned, Tana uses the ease of capture, ease of data capture of Rome, has the UI flexibility of Notion, and then the data handling flexibility of air tables. Is that, is that roughly right? And, and okay. So I understand those choices in terms of, uh, the tool side, but you also emphasize, you know, when we were talking initially that, you know, Tana is a set of tools and social systems. So I want to double click on social systems a bit. Like I understand the tools part, but what are these social systems? What do you mean by them? So, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about knowledge management in companies as well. Um, I worked at Minerva for three years, and I think it's a pretty typical, well-run, you know, mature startup. It's about uh, 60 people, 15, 20 in the development team, and we use a lot of SaaS products. And of course, we have Notion and uh, Asana and Google Docs and Slack and GitHub and Figma, and we're constantly pasting links back and forth and, uh, you know, the fact is, at because we had a very good setup and good project managers running around making sure uh, everything was up to date, at the week-to-week -week level, it worked. It could obviously have been smoother, but it worked. Everyone knew what they were working on. The managers knew what was blocking uh, and so on. Uh, and a, a better tool could have saved a lot of friction, but it wouldn't have been a game changer. What would have been a game changer, especially for Minerva and these kind of companies that are not trying to just produce 10% more widgets the next quarter, but are trying to solve really hard problems over long periods of time. Uh, for example, at Minerva, one of the problems that I and my group worked on was how do you design a grading system for a university from scratch where you have almost no limitations? And you know, what are the things that you optimize for? What are your hypotheses? How do you balance things like, on the one hand, measuring as accurately as possible the learning that happens, and on the other hand, incentivizing what you know to be productive student behavior? So we had so many conversations and micro insights about this happening throughout Slack conversations, uh, in weekly meetings that were documented in long Google Docs, and it was impossible to really synthesize all of that. Um, it only lived in people's memory. And if someone left, it was all gone. Uh, and so if we could have had even the backlink system of Rome and tell, and you know, if I could have known that this Google Doc was actually discussed in the Slack conversation, that would have al already been a step forwards. But what we really need is for the community, and in this case, the community is the, the firm's employees, to constantly be um, revisiting, using spaced repetition, using searches, using serendipity, uh, putting in their insights, tagging them, uh, synthesizing, crystallizing, coming up with hypotheses, revisiting those hypotheses, and, and creating something that is mo much more than the, the sum of all of those little things. And right now, Tana doesn't have a solution for that. But, uh, and, and in fact, I think some of the most advanced work that has been done is in the Rome book clubs where they're looking at how can uh, several hundred to a thousand people be reading the same book, be taking personal 
notes, stuff that's relevant to you. And at the same time, identify those insights or those questions that are relevant to the community and in a kind of hive fashion, uh, you know, come to some crystallized uh, understanding. So I'm hoping that Tana can be um, a kind of a hive of experimentation uh, and prototyping, uh, both in the community, in a number of companies, including Tana itself, which of course uses Tana every day, uh, you know, to, to build the social technologies and the actual technology supporting that hand in hand. Let me let me recap recap that because that is especially exciting. So the kind of world that you're trying to build for is, let's say, some Slack conversations are happening. Some some guy has some open tabs that he's sharing on a screen share, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You want somehow for all of them to be uniformly tagged, so that if someone's trying to search them up in a sophisticated way, say three years after half the team has left. He can still get them up super easily and in an accelerated fashion. I mean, of course, a lot of things that happen are ephemeral. Uh, a lot of the Slack conversation is, hey, are we meeting on Friday? What's the link to the meeting room and so on? And, you know, after a week, they're probably never going to be useful again. Uh, but, the, but the problem is it's very hard to predict where the good insights are going to appear. And you need as little friction as possible. That's the first thing, to capture it. Uh, when you're seeing something, say, oh, wow, that's a good insight. Like, what is the smallest thing that you can do to make sure that that uh, is not going to disappear? It's going to, and even maybe, you know, just adding a simple tag and knowing that you have a workflow where all the things that you tagged, maybe once a week, they all come up and you can easily say, oh, actually, this wasn't so important. Oh, this is important. I'm going to assign this to something, right? You need to have these workflows to let you revisit things. And then you need to start coming up with hooks. And this is to me, you know, uh, Andy Matushak has this concept of like note names as APIs, where he doesn't name a note like, I don't know, a spaced repetition. He comes up with a statement like spaced repetition can be helpful to learn. Uh, the, you know, he has basically his whole idea is in the note name and he changes the note name as his understanding improves. So we need to start not just tagging things with this is project A and this is about learning, this is about transfer, but starting to actually capture our burgeoning insight. Um, and then once we have those hooks, we, you know, we start seeing them everywhere, right? And, and so once you've put a name to something that's just a little bit amorphous, you start recognizing it. And that's something that you can do as an individual, but I think it is something that can also be done as a small group. Um, that's very interesting because the way you talk about kind of aggregating this knowledge and kind of, I'll call it uniformly tagging it, is a very human process, like uh, a weekly review, space repetition, as opposed to, say, a machine learning drive process. Why, why is that? I think machine learning is going to play a huge role. I mean, it is incredible what has been happening with a large language models in the last few years. And so the, I guess the bet that we're taking at Tana is that these kind of models will work exponentially better if already given a strong structure, um, right? So you could imagine that, okay, here's my drive with 500 Google Docs. Uh, please, uh, Siri, you know, tell me what my business strategy should be. Um, and it's not impossible they will find something interesting. Um, our bet at Tana is that if you have already done a bunch of the work of structuring, of selecting, of beginning to make connections, um, the AI will be much more useful, both in helping you then automate that work. So if you train it to say that these are the things I'm interested in, these are the fields, then maybe a lot of that work can happen automatically. But also that if you structure information um, where you already do some of that processing, um, the insights are going to be much more relevant. And then I, I also believe, and I don't know exactly what's the balance, but it's clear that part of the work, the work of structuring is providing you with insight, right? And so we need to figure out the balance of what is the work that we do? What is the work that the AI is doing? Uh, what is the interplay where we're optimally um, effective, but also optimally generative? Uh, very, very interesting conversation. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, I, I feel like we can continue this conversation for another 24 hours still. Um, so I'm very excited to bring you back 
Stian, maybe in half a year or so, and you know, do a deeper dive in the social system because we also spend a lot of time thinking about uh, you know knowledge distribution and uh, propagation in communities. You know, because we we also spend a lot of time interacting with our community, trying to you know empower them to build products and you know solve problems that they're working on. Uh, so definitely very, very interesting topics to, to talk about. And hopefully, uh, you know, as you, as you said, you know, this is a sandbox for you to figure these things out over the next year or so. And, and we would love to bring you back at some point, but let's wrap up this session. So what are, what are the verdicts like Amar after this conversation? Uh, how, how, what are you going to think about differently going forward? And Stian, what is, what is the takeaway what's the message that people should think about after this conversation well this is a tough one this is a tough one still it's dropped so many golden nuggets there for me the one thing i guess i'm going to think most about is the experience you describe roam power users have after a year two years of power usage which essentially is what, what tana is solving using its uh, more sophisticated filtering i'm going to think about ways of how ML can do that as well. Because aggregate intellect, like Tana is doing, uh, approaching it more from a social uh, perspective. Aggregate intellect is approaching it more from an ML perspective. So that's that's probably going to be my key takeaway. For me, I think, you know, I'm really interested in, I mentioned in, in the pre-talk, the idea of slow Twitter. Uh, there is so much intellect, there are so many ideas, there's so much inspiration on Twitter and yet it feels so shallow and so frustrating. And I would love to hear from anyone who is interested in going deeper, who has ideas about how we could have something that collectively builds into some kind of artifact, into some kind of shared understanding over a longer time span. And I would love to uh, do some uh, social experiments on Tana this fall. Uh, so let me know if you're interested in that, but I'm also very happy to uh, play on other platforms or even just, you know, let's send each other an email once a week and you're not allowed to write more than two sentences and, you know, whatever crazy rules that uh, can kind of uh, tweet, you know, nudge us in, in just um, experimenting with that because I think um, it, it is the next, you know, if we're going to make some progress on the problems that we have to solve, uh, that is, you know, where we need to head. Definitely. Um, you know, as, as, our audience knows we are very interested in all of these questions and uh, hopefully we will bring in more speakers who are working in this space and uh, you know creating a lot of interesting tools and methodologies and processes. Thank you so much for being with us today, Stian. It was a very fun conversation and thanks Amar for co-hosting and hope to see you all next week for the next episode. Thank you for joining us today.